think everyone has more or less gotten online now. Yes, absolutely. Maybe make a tentative start. Okay, right. -o. We're going to start in a moment, colleagues. You all will be muted now, unfortunately. So you're going to have to listen for a while and use the chat function. Right, everyone, on your topic of our webinar this morning, unlocking will and related methodologies. Uh, you can all hear me. Nora, you can hear me? Hearing you, I'm hearing you very well, uh, loudly. Now clear, thank clear. You. Okay, fantastic. Uh, colleagues, so this uh, webinar is really sort of born between, or the initiative came from Yusuf, uh, and with my involvement with Yusuf on the World of Work Strategy Group, I'm sort of being the facilitator for this webinar, but the, on the, before we even start, I would really like to extend my sincere appreciation to uh, Prof. Ahmed Bawa, who is the CEO, uh, for just being the fantastic person that he is and for always sharing his wisdom and knowledge. So thank you very much for that, CEO. And then the rest of the staff at USA, absolutely amazing. Nora, uh, Zana, Zama, the Lindas. It's just been amazing how you've just gone the extra mile to make this impossible. So thank you very, very much for that. What we're going to do, we're going to give you sort of an overview of uh, how the program is going to run. Uh, so to the next slide. Okay, there's the world of uh, the welcome to you for the first webinar uh, on wall exploring the, the impact of COVID and then the subsequent responses of universities. I think we are all on the same page with that. And like I've said, brought to you by uh, University of South Africa, the World of Work Strategy Group, and then supported by Entrepreneurship Development in Higher Education, especially there, Nora. Thank you very, very much. I know you're driving that. Right, colleagues, they, I was kind of forced to do this to provide a little bit more information about your, myself. You can all now see how beautiful I am. Uh, just a joke, it's just, but uh, there, there's just a little bit of background with me, uh, my involvement uh, with Yusuf and then SATN. And then I've been in the game for a while, 24 years. And the studies that I've done have also focused on work integrated learning and service learning on the master's degree level, the roles that are achieving the critical cross-field outcomes, and then my doctoral degree was a strategy to optimize the contribution of world towards enhancing the employability of students. So, that's about me, I think. Okay, there's just some housekeeping rules for you. Obviously, your microphone will be muted centrally. If you wish to speak, click on the raise hand icon and remember to lower your hand afterwards. Feel free to keep your webcam on during the webinar. Uh, also ensure that it's positioned on eye level. I had a bit of a tutorial yesterday, thank you, Nora, on how to position the camera. Uh, and then uh, once we've done the welcome, there'll be a bit of a presentation by me panel will get involved and then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A after that. Uh, but please, it's very important, feel free to engage in the chat function. Uh, and uh, as we progress, don't wait, uh, continuously use your, the chat function so that we can see Nora will keep an eye on us. Obviously, we would like as many people to make a contribution as possible, but time permitting, we will see how that goes. Right, the, the purpose, uh, colleagues, as you all want to share ideas. Uh, we all are in different university types and come from different backgrounds. So the wonderful thing is that we can tap into different perspectives. 
on on wall and the this pandemic facing us and uh, to see what what we are all doing we are all in different contexts like with the cut we're right in the middle of the country a uot now how are we res uh, responding to this say in relation to uct they in the little fishing village by the sea uh, to hear what they are doing <coughs> and then obviously for uh, um, a comprehensive university like the university of johannesburg for example what are you doing and that is the whole idea is then to develop guidelines and recommendations because you would have seen the chE memorandums uh, that they are looking for some sort of feedback there was a, a communication teaching practice to tell people sort of this is the do's and the don'ts and Part of what we would like to achieve with this webinar is to give something to the CHE that then they can send out as a whole document so that the universities can be guided through this whole process. So you are pioneers today and input is extremely valued and important. Okay, so now without further ado, I would like to introduce our CEO, Prof. Ahmed Bawa to do the official welcoming for us. Prof. Bauer, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Henry. And uh, so let me just say, uh, so pleased to be a part of this mass meeting. It's, uh, it's really fun. <laughs> uh, it's really fun. And uh, I hope very much that uh, this will be the start of uh, many others. Um, let me just begin by saying that the, um, you know, that the idea of the World of Work strategy group that Henry uh, mentioned earlier uh, really came from an engagement, uh, two engagements. The first engagement was a, an engagement at SATN uh, where there was a view that there wasn't enough of a kind of an interface between the university sector and the world of work, if you like. So, uh, places around, you know, the, the, the places where our, our, our graduates work, uh, places where they do their internships, uh, the kind of research enterprises, the in intersection around research enterprises and so on, that uh, this was, uh, was it being done in a systematic way? Um, and, uh, and there was a kind of view that uh, at the board of USAP, which is the vice chancellors, that there was a need for um, a really kind of a specific kind of strategy group that would focus on this. So the World of Work Strategy Group is really an attempt by USAP to, um, to create a kind of more formal kind of engagement between the university sector and the world of work, if you like. Of course, this became much more uh, apparent and uh, of relevance uh, with the unfolding of uh, the new, this new technology moment that we are in, you know, what some people call the fourth industrial revolution and, and so on. It was uh, really that kind of really powerful, this really powerful moment around the, this new technology moment that uh, provided the impetus really because it suddenly dawned on us that that's, there were certain areas in which uh, we were just not keeping up with the big changes that were taking place uh, in the world of work. And of course, uh, the whole issue around uh, kind of work integrated learning, internships, uh, uh, kind of uh, clinical practice, uh, uh, um, all of the kinds of things that our students do uh, in the process of their studying, uh, that that was going to be hugely impacted by this new technology moment and so on. So um, we created this structure that is called the World of Work Strategy Group. Uh, by the way, there, uh, that's the fifth strategy group at uh, USAP. The first one is teaching and learning, and that one is chaired by uh, Dr. Sizwe Mabizela, the Vice Chancellor at Rhodes. The second one is research and innovation. That's chaired by Professor Toko Maikiso at uh, Mpumalanga University, or University of Mpumalanga. Uh, third one is, um, the funding strategy group, which is always a big headache. Uh, and that one is chaired by Professor Kupe from University of Pretoria. Yeah. The fourth one is the transformation strategy group. That's chaired by Professor Mandra Makanya at uh, UNISA. And the fifth one is the World of Work strategy group. And this one, uh, we agree that the board of USAP would be chaired by a vice chancellor of one of our universities of technology. And, uh, and so that one is chaired by 
Professor Henk de Jager at uh, CUT. So um, there are four or five large uh, sub-projects within the World of Work Strategy Group. But one of the most important ones is this one around uh, kind of work integrated learning, internships, and so on. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say very much because, you know, this is really something for us, for, for us all to discuss together. Uh, but what I did want to say was that, you know, just very quickly to say that as far as I can tell, you know, and there might be others, but there are four kind of key projects, uh, four key project areas. The first one is just this area around kind of building a theory of work integrated learning internships and so on. Now, of course, there's been a lot of work in that area already. You know, there's this very good uh, document that was put together by the CHE a few years ago. I can't remember exactly when, but it must have been about five or six years ago uh, around work integrated learning internships and so on. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, I think that there's still work to be done in that area, in particular because of this new technology moment that we are in and coming to grips with uh, how the new technology moment is changing the world of work uh, and therefore changing uh, work integrated learning and so on. So uh, that's the one. Uh, and I think that there's still you know, some really interesting work to be done there around uh, the philosophy, the pedagogy and so on, and just trying to understand how to optimize uh, that uh, you know the, that whole area as uh, as uh, 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 the whole area of work integrated learning for our students and the second is uh, really the issue of modalities and uh, you know I think we all all of us are engaged in some form of work integrated learning uh, it, and by the way you know it happens not just at undergraduate it also happens at postgraduate level and so on but work integrated learning is really a critical area of engagement around trying to understand how to uh, how to build a nexus between theory and practice, how to try and ensure that we are not just training people who are kind of who are theoretically bent or who are practically bent, but that we bring those two together into a kind of uh, into a whole because that's how learning happens. Uh, you know, I keep saying to people, I'm a theoretical physicist, by the way, but I keep saying to people that. Uh, I have to learn the techniques of mathematics right, to be able to do my physics because uh, otherwise I just can't make any progress because mathematics is the language of physics. But that's really practical knowledge. It's like saying I'm learning, you know, I'm not doing, you know, I don't study the foundations of mathematics. I just study the kind of what is the, the, the practical use of mathematics in, in, in doing my physics, if you like. So, so all of us at all levels are engaging in some form of work integrated learning, bringing theory and practice together and trying to understand how those fit with each other, how they relate to each other and so on. Uh, so uh, it's the issue of modalities. It's like saying, you know, what are the different modalities for doing, for creating this kind of theory praxis nexus, if you like. Uh, the third one is just the issue around uh, kind of the, the, the the infrastructure that's required for this. Uh, and by infrastructure, I don't mean buildings. I mean, you know, what kinds of, uh, you know, what kinds of structures do we need our universities? Uh, what kind of support do our students need? How do we build relationships between, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the stuff that goes on in the departments and the stuff that goes on in, whether it's the co-op office or the work integrated learning office or whatever it is, how do we bring those to work together optimally. So what kinds of infrastructure do we need to make this work effectively? And then the fourth one is just this area around uh, the platforms for engagement between the universities and, uh, and, and, and the world of work. Just uh, creating and using those platforms, not, not just for work integrated learning, but also for teaching and learning, for research, for ensuring that uh, there's an ongoing conversation about uh, whether the curriculum fits and so on and so forth, but using this as a platform to uh, uh, to kind of really build much stronger linkages between industry and or employers and and universities. Um, uh, Henry, I'll just completely finish with one little point, and that is that I, I think that uh, COVID nineteen, uh, this pandemic that we are in, 
And by the way, we are still just very much at the start of it. I mean, you know, just nobody knows like just when it's, where it's going to take us. Uh, I think also has to provide us with an impetus of trying to understand whether our current approaches and the current modalities of uh, work integrated learning are kind of uh, need to be revisited, need to be rethought, and uh, whether there's a, there, there's a space for a heightened use of technology and, you know, whether we can begin to think about new forms of uh, work integrated learning uh, that uh, kind of flow from this crisis that we are in and so on. So, um, so it's just a kind of contextual point really that, uh, you know, what what the virologists tell us, and there, there are several papers written about this, uh, which indicate, they indicate that, um, that because of human density, not globally, but in specific areas of the world, you know, just where people in big cities, for example, you know, New York has got nine and a half million people. Cairo, I think, has 18 million people, you know, uh, just a huge con, you know, congestions of people, if you like that it is almost likely, that is most likely, that we are going to have recurring uh, kind of public health uh, challenges in the years ahead. Um, and it's good, it, what they're saying is that we have to really begin to think about how we organize uh, the world of work, the world of universities, the world of uh, schooling and also on, um, taking into account uh, the possibility that uh, these kinds of outbreaks uh, might occur in the future. Uh, so I'll stop there and just say, I'll, I'll be in the meeting for a while. Uh, I'll leave at some point, but I'll let uh, Henry and Nora know when I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> but I really look forward to uh, to kind of listening and being part of the discussion and, and look forward very much to seeing what comes out of it. Uh, just before I leave, just to thank uh, Nora and uh, Zana and Linda, I think, uh, to, for helping to put this together. I think it was uh, uh, fantastic. I, I, I just noticed we've got 118 participants now and it genuinely is a, a mass meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for, for those words of welcome and indeed wisdom that you've shared for us. And you've also mentioned a couple of interesting things to look at. So when you spoke of platforms of engagement and new forms of work integrated learning, uh, and the thing that you will know is we're busy to develop of practice for work integrated learning or learning in practice uh, that will be established within the next month or so. Uh, and again, to all the colleagues out there, all the information that you've sent uh, can I apologize for all the documentation that I've sent to you and asked to complete but that information is extremely valuable in getting all the role players in work and rated learning and related methodologies identified so that when we establish our community of practice that we get everyone involved. And we would also like to establish a LinkedIn page where we can get together more often and share ideas and frustrations and challenges and solutions. So thank you very much, uh, Prof Bauer, most appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, Nora, I think we need to go to my presentation now. Colleagues, as Nora is busy sort of getting the presentation ready, what I can tell you, uh, and again, this is now, I mentioned earlier, I've got 24 years experience in work integrated learning. And it's just absolutely amazing. It absolutely amazes me every time, you know, the the selflessness and dedication of people in education in general, and then linked with uh, work integrated learning in particular. Uh, I mean, the the dedication and sort of the sincerity with which you've communicated with me, and that I can see that you feel for your students and your institutions and all the relevant other stakeholders is really most appreciated. So thank you very, very much for that. Uh, what I'm going to do with the presentation, is, uh, like you say, 
can see it's addressing the, the theme or the topic of the webinar to unlock will and related methodologies. So as introduction, uh, we're going to have to look at uh, develop guidelines and recommendations. This is sort of in the end, the end goal that we to achieve is to get these guidelines and recommendations developed that we can send off to the CHE. But before that, I would just like to provide a bit of context. And that's why I would like to talk a little bit about work integrated learning principles. Uh, this might be old hat to most of you, but just to ensure, because we're going to deal with different terminologies that's coming up there, work integrated learning, service learning, for example, that we're just on the same page uh, when, when we talk about these things. And then in the end, what we will need to do is to get to the guidelines, like I've stated earlier, for which your input will be highly appreciated and most valued. Right, to move on, <clears throat> the background or part of the reason for this meeting is the, you will all know the, the communique that came from DHIT regarding teaching practice, uh, where they provided some sort of minimum guidelines to people in, in the field of teaching practice, how to go about teaching practice in these, the times that we are currently in. And then there were also further communiques or memorandums from the CHE. Uh, the one specifically aimed at actions completing the academic year and then the other one going a bit deeper to say uh, what alternatives, the alternatives that we have at our disposal, like service learning world, practicals, internships, what about them and the related requirements for assessment and professional registration by professional bodies. Uh, what can we contribute in this regard? Because especially people in the medical field and uh, in, in the other fields as well, registration with uh, uh, professional bodies is a big thing. And we don't, we don't want to disadvantage our students and their further careers. That just as far as, far as that background is concerned. Then moving on. With world principles. If we look at work integrated learning, if you read the literature, people, you'll very often see that people refer to it as a chameleon term. And the reason for that is that there is a lot of terminology out there. People speak of work integrated learning, experiential learning, internships, clinical training, all sorts of things. But if you analyze the literature, there is one commonality. And that commonality is that there are two sides of learning which require alignment and integration of learning. So what we are looking for is to apply and merge theoretical knowledge gained in academic study with practical work experience. So that's kind of the point of departure or the commonality that you can read in all of these terminologies. The fundamental principle, if you read the literature about work integrated learning, is that it's about knowledge Knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. And a lot has been written about this. If you go back in history a little bit, you'll read the work of Dewey and Piaget and all sorts of people who've contributed to this body of knowledge. But then it was uh, Professor Kolb who really got a handle on this to say, but this is the fundamental thing that we need to look at. Knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. And this happens in accordance with the full cycle. Now, what that cycle entails, you almost probably know by now, is that it starts off with a direct experience that the student has, which is followed by a reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and then experimentation with those abstracts formed. A key thing to remember here is that reflection is of critical importance. Uh, students must be able to reflect, and those of all of us who are in the academe will know uh, how important reflection is to cultivate deep learning. Now, within the South African context, we are all familiar with the HEQSF. And in accordance to the HEQSF, will might take various forms. And these are the modalities that I'm referring to, uh, like workplace-based, uh, which is the one which is most probably uh, we are all most familiar with, where students go out into industry, but then there are also others like simulations, 
problem-based learning, project-based learning, and work-directed theoretical learning. This was uh, captured in the uh, publication that Robawa referred to earlier uh, of the CA. Right, then if we look at terminology, just to get clarity in terms of the terminology, uh, you'll see all sorts of things appearing on the screen now. A general practitioner, an oncologist, a neurosurgeon, and a nephrologist. Now, if we look at these, what do all of these terminologies have in common? When, when you have to go to any one of these, you don't say, oh, I'm going to the neurosurgeon. That's what you say, I'm going to the doctor. And so the doctor is the overarching terminology for all of this. Uh, you don't say, I'm going to the general practitioner, you say, I'm going to the doctor. Now the same with the, the modalities of work integrated learning. If we speak of workplace-based learning, which is the more common one, I guess we can call it the general practitioner, uh, problem-based learning, project-based learning, uh, might be the neurosurgeon, and then simulations and work-directed theoretical learning. Now, when we speak of all of them, we don't say we've got, we speak of our workplace-based learning students, we speak of our work-integrated learning students. So that is quite the necessary context for you in this regard, when we talk of wall, we talk of all the modalities as well. But more commonly, it will refer to students in practice, the first modality that we use. But something important in addition that we need to note is that wall is a curriculum matter by heart. So if you look at work and graded learning, there are always three parties involved, um, the student, the employer, and the university. But if, if you look at it more carefully, you will see that we can refer to it really as a tripartite curriculum strategy to align the academic learning with learning in the workplace. And there you'll see it all together with the various role players. We first of all have the student, then we have the university, then we have the employer, and they're all brought together by the curriculum. Now, the intention of this is for all of these parties to join hands to form a partnership. And that is, in my view, also a, a huge reason for the success of, of work integrated learning and related methodologies is because it's curriculum driven and it's an inclusive process of all the role players involved. Then lastly, in terms of terminology, I just want to point out um, about work integrated learning and service learning, just the differences between the two. Both are forms of experiential learning or learning by experience. But if you look at work integrated learning, it is industry based, whereas service learning is more community based. The aim, more or less, of work integrated learning is to enhance your career, whereas service learning is more about cultivating civic responsibility. And then Work integrated learning is a bit more selfish with the primary beneficiary being the student, whilst in service learning, there's a 50-50, a reciprocity that's involved so between the student and the community. Right, so this is as far as the terminology is concerned. What I've also done is if you look at the recommendations, the recommendations that I've drawn up, you'll see there's five of them and we're quickly gonna go through all five of them. What I've done is I've looked at all the contributions that you've sent, where you spoke about your challenges and then the solutions that you have proposed. <laughs> and I've tried to group all of them, sort of by way of a matrix analysis, to get them grouped into, a, into five. And then other draft proposals that you would like to present as recommendations. So the first one is the what exit and program level outcomes, how can we use that? If we look at the implementation, we can look at the manner in which will is structured in the curriculum related to the outcomes to be achieved. Now, how do we do this? Should an outcome, just go back, sorry, Nora. Should an outcome be specifically related to time spent in industry? It will obviously require different approaches regarding when and how this time will be made up. Uh, later in the program, working on weekends, extra hours. Uh, there's lots what, that we can add to this and I would appreciate your input in this regard. But then you'll see with every recommendation at the bottom, I've put something in brackets 
almost like a warning or something to take note of, is that we must always bear in mind that we should keep the achievement of a critical cross-field outcomes in mind, which has to be present in all the qualifications, as well the graduate attributes. What we must keep in mind here as well is if you read a bit about the literature, you'll see the role that will and service learning plays in achieving the critical cross-field and graduate attributes for example, in particular. So this is something to consider moving forward that some of the outcomes that you thought you might have achieved through academic and uh, lecturing in the classroom can be achieved in the way you structure your world component. It's the first one. Then the second one relates to the credit allocation to, to work integrated learning. Now, given an example there, just I say, the credit allocation and notional hour, hours implications of these credits. One credit, we all know, is 10 hours of notional learning. So in cases where 60 credits are allocated to will, it equates to 600 notional hours. Now, if you divide those hours by 40 hours per week, you get 15 weeks or more or less four months. So the suggestion is, that especially if, since we are running out of time and to wanting to get the students completing, especially their workplace-based learning still this year, is that this is something that can be used to say, but the six months can indeed be completed in four months if you just look at the notional hours attached to the credits. But again, it's important to note that the outcomes to be achieved should still be achieved in cases where it was assumed that this period is equal to six months and obviously it will have to be done in consultation with relevant will employers. But it does provide a bit of an avenue to say, but if we cannot get the six months in, we can go for four months if we look at the notional hour allocation. So that's the second one. Then the third one that we can have a look at will be other will modalities. Now, as I've indicated earlier, simulation, work directed, problem and project-based learning. Then some of the examples, and uh, thank you very much. There was a lot of colleagues who sent in very good examples of this. And this is not an exhaustive list. It is something that you can also further use and, and I would like us to add on to this. Something that does, uh, I think that maybe that not everyone has thought of, or, or I'm not too sure if, if everyone has, is that this, pandemic does provide an opportunity as well, especially with problem-based learning, so that it's a real work-based problem that we are faced with now, that we're currently experiencing, and how can we address this? Then obviously the simulation of the work environment on and off campus where possible, we can use our own campuses as work environments, for example, lecture rooms, uh, as classrooms after hours and over weekends for education students to assist schools. Because we, we've seen the announcements by the relevant ministers and it seems like there will be a bit of extra tuition required for, for the learners in the, the basic education field. So this does provide an opportunity as well. How can we use our facilities to assist them and assist well in the same process? And then the others would be obviously events functions hosted by the universities and invited, inviting employers as guest lecturers. Something that's interesting that I saw was seminars and workshops. A lot of universities send that through. Uh, very interesting how you can then get a lot of people involved. Because uh, it seems like if you want to reach more students, that might be an option that you, you can go for. But again, care should be taken that the outcomes should be achieved at the appropriate level it was curriculated at. Right, then the next one. Uh, I've grouped these under assessment. And if you look at the reports assignments that students need to submit, can be adjusted to the will modality selected and accordingly assessed. So video clips was something that grew very strongly as individual group assignments. Then constructive criticism on possible solutions provided to problem statement scenarios, reflective journals, patchwork texts, role plays. There's a whole host of them there. Then the suggestion at the bottom would be that the will period on the timetable can be used for assessments and or making use of employers to assist. 
but obviously again just to say that whatever you do needs to comply with the relevant level at which it was curriculated and then lastly the role of professional bodies something that i've seen that's come through as well is that you can consider uh, you'll also be able to provide your input is conditional registration of students by professional bodies and that also came through the CHE documentation, especially relationship and communication that we need to have with our professional bodies, is to see, wouldn't it be an option to request professional bodies for the conditional registration of students who need to make up working hours missing 2020 during then 2021? These hours can be made up once the students are employed, possibly as part of a probation period, to be followed by full registration once the missing hours are completed during 2021. So it will, and another thing to consider would be relaxing of professional requirements for will, for example, the number of students to be increased per qualified technologist. I know, especially in the field of clinical technology and in engineering, also there's only a certain number of students that you are allowed to place per qualified engineer. So that is permission that we will will have to obtain from the professional bodies. So colleagues, that is what I have to say. What I would like to do is to hand over to the panel and for them to provide their inputs. Now, our panel consists out of uh, three people that we've specifically selected per university type. So there will be uh, someone from the traditional universities, Dr. Engela van Staden, and then from the University of Technology Environment, can we again say those who weren't here, a doctor now from this way, Nofamela, and from uh, a, a comprehensive university, uh, Dr. Roline Brank from UJ. So Dr. Van Staden, if you could start off for us, please. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, you guys took me off video, so if you want to put me back on video, I don't know if that is possible, um, but I'm going to start while you revisiting that. Um, okay, you're asking me to do that. Okay, here I am. Thank you, very much, Henry, colleagues, and good morning to everybody. Um, you're mostly probably wondering why I'm doing it from a traditional university. I'm at Free State University now. And it was a learning experience in terms of the challenges that um, our students on the traditional platform is actually experiencing. And as Professor uh, Ahmed Bauer, Professor Bauer said, different approaches, different practices towards work integrated learning, experiential learning, service learning. And I really want to uh, focus on my presentation on the clinical training. And I saw a lot of the comments coming through. That is a major concern for us specifically now. So I'm going to divorce my response to your presentation, Henry, basically in terms of the vocational vis-a-vis -vis the professional programs. And I think the vocational programs are very much embedded within universities of technology. But in terms of the professional programs, it is very interesting to see that we have major challenges because we have work integrated components or workplace based learning components within the programs as curriculated as typically the vocational programs, but we have also outside our programs like the engineering programs. So um, one of the requirements in terms of boards and councils is that we have to fulfill inherent requirements as stipulated and approved. And it is not a situation like a CHE provided as within this time frame, upliftment of the moratorium of not going online, not doing blended because you're a contact face-to-face uh, -face institution. So we're sitting with that dynamics that the engagement of the professional bodies is pivotal. So there are different approaches to that and guidelines to make sure we can get that going. And I'm going to talk more about that. But our major concern is in terms of the quality that's going to happen now. Again, if I can refer to the engineering programs, is there's a reduced number of companies that are now available to our students into the workplace. And that is for the, the typical OT programs as well as for the traditional programs. Um, the other one is also monitoring and completing of the competencies obtained. That is a focus point of the specific health professional council. And we've already got information back from some of the professional boards that were very strict in their approach. They understand it's an emergency, they understand that it's COVID uh, 
90, they're not lifting those kind of requirements. And I think that is the kind of guidance we're looking now at. The third component I want to talk about is the platform for clinical teaching and training. Remember the health and the allied health programs have, are subjected to uh, exposure on different levels. And for instance, at Free State University, when we required our medical students to come back, as, as stated by the Minister of Higher Education and Training, when we approached the hospitals, they said, we're not ready. You can't bring your students back. So there's a, this junction in between, the coordination between two government departments, where we want to put our final medical year students back on the clinical training platform from the 11th of May, why the hospital platform is saying that, sorry, we're not ready. It's too risky, firstly. Secondly, we are working at a 50% capacity of our staff. If we bring our medical students back, it is looking at to that kind of risk. It's exposing not only the patients, it's also exposing our clinical students. So we're sitting with that kind of dynamics. And I think it's very important that we have a dedicated um, consultation with the health professional boards and uh, the council and the boards. Um, the other one I also wanted to make is sure that a lot of our programs are based on internships, like law, like accounting, like uh, psychology, um, like engineering. It's also outside the responsibility of the university, but it is still uh, engagement of the companies, the employees, the industry to enable our students to go back on that platform. So, um, have to what the universities that we have recovery plans. So part of the guidelines must be clearly stating what is your recovery plan. You've mentioned um, in terms of simulation, pro project-based learning. Now those, if we do comply that specifically in our context from a traditional university, you're not fulfilling the minimum requirements as per the professional bodies. And that kind of engagement needs to happen with the professional bodies. The teaching practice uh, component from the DHET uh, proposes a decrease in the minimum requirements or notional hours of teachers, students on the DBE platform. That's not available in clinical uh, practices and training. So maybe that what we should look at in terms of going forward now. What we have proposed as the Free State University is that we work through our associations. Um, there's an association for nursing deans, uh, for health deans, for medical deans, for law deans, for um, accounting deans, in terms of psychiatrists, etc., etc. And we have pursued that. So the engagement with professional bodies becomes from a deans association, and it's a collective approach towards trying to recover the time lost on the clinical training platform. Um, I think that's about all that I wanted to say. Sorry, so Henry, I did not focus on the vocation. I actually focused more on your last two slides and your recommendation in terms of the professional. Thank you very much, Ingela. Most appreciated. Uh, Dr. Fundiswe. Thank you, Henry. Um, I've kind of captured my, my, my response to you in, um, with uh, with some kind of a presentation because I wanted to ask to I wanted can take is it showing I'm trying to share yeah it is oh, it's okay. showing it's showing all right so for me I wanted to respond with um, examples of how at MUT we have um, structured or captured the the modalities. So um, the next, the, this slide shows how we have um, looked at it. Basically, we've looked at the modalities as put through, as put forward by the CHE. And we have said to those, which are the ones that prioritize the two sides of learning as Henry had, had, had spoken about, and also give the applied learning. For us, we're having a very strong focus on applied learning. So we've captured that to say our work integrated learning will look at the various modalities, specifically those where students can be off campus. 
So that would be workplace-based learning, which is prevalent mostly in our engineering and natural sciences. Um, professional practicum is um, specifically in env environmental health. Then we've got project-based learning for which we have stipulated that it can't just be any project, but it has to be a project that is real, that is um, that is in the workplace or done together with an external partner. So an example for us there is what we're currently doing with our mechanical engineering students where we are unable to, okay, here's something else, that project-based learning can only be implemented where we are unable to place, to get placement opportunities. So one of the things that we do is we do project-based learning together with some of the TVET centers of excellence, where our students go in, they use the excellent machinery that these centers of excellence, of, of excellence has, and they work on specific projects. So for an example, our mechanical engineering students, they, they do mechanical tools, they make design, they conceptualize design and make mechanical tools in these centers of excellence. And those tools then are channeled back into the onto campus and we use them to teach students. Our work integrated learning is um, underpinned by um, a strong career development portfolio. And our flagship there is the work readiness training, which happens pre-placement and you will see that I've um, included, I've, I've kind of colored that the same with simulations. So in terms of the modalities for us, simulations are a pre-placement activity which prepares the students for placement. So what this therefore means is that in our work readiness program, we've included sim a, a simulation element. Our um, UOT colleague, my UOT colleagues will identify that as what we refer to as the employability improvement program. So that is how we've looked at the modalities. My response to um, the achievement of the exit level outcomes. For us, um, we've looked at what would be the impact of COVID-19 and um, we see that the students would be out by at least one month. And um, we've conceptualized that this can be accommodated through extra shifts and work and we, and we can work with um, where the employers agree or an extra month of placement, which would mean that the students would then, which would actually mean that the students um, would finish off around about February. Um, as opposed to um, in December, for an example. A major consideration there would be the CETA funding issues. Um, so that is something that we, um, that we still need to toy, toy with. In terms of the assessments, um, what we have in place now are retired professionals that work with us as part-time staff, they assist with the visitation monitoring and assessment. And these people post COVID-19 are going to be critical in reducing the workload of our, of, of our will coordinators, because then they really are going to help us in the assessment which happens in the workplace. Of course, the additional plan is the use of blended learning, um, where students that are outside of KZN will be required to do their presentations online. The challenge that uh, to be considered again um, is um, restrictions with regards to employers who are often concerned with um, intellectual property and issues of confidentiality. For professional bodies, I agree with the conditional um, registration. I'm just cautious in that not all students are, un are able to access jobs immediately after will placement. Thus, uh, the achievement of the outcomes may be challenging for those that are unable to, um, to access jobs. Secondly, the relaxation of the professional requirements, in my view, um, we, we would need to be careful in that because, for an example, in engineering, the ratio is one in five. 
Um, so if you increase the cohort of students under one mentor, um, it might just limit the learning. My suggestion there is that we need to look at promoting project collaborations with industry for students to work on these on camp campus for where well, whilst they are campus based. For an example, where students needed to finish off projects, they can then do that as as, um, um, as a project on campus so that it takes away the impact within the work environment so that the employer can continue to work and accommodate the next cohort of students but the current cohort is able to complete um, what they were doing thank you thank you very much all right uh, really? morning everyone um when they asked me specifically to have a conversation about the project-based learning that we're currently doing within the university. Uh, in the University of Johannesburg, we have different modalities and uh, in the College of Business and Economics where I'm currently situated is, we're serving 50, over 50% 50 of the university student intake. And there's different work integrated learning modalities within the College of Business and Economics. We have the hospitality management that is currently a major issue for us because we can't place the students because of COVID. So we need to start looking at different strategies. So we are currently looking at that. But then as well, I'm currently doing my work integrated learning modality that I'm currently doing is uh, project based learning. And I must say it's actually an actual excellent um, modality to use in the circumstances of COVID-19. And my motivation for that is specifically, I have 100 students that are working on 12 different projects that was identified in the agriculture area. So I have 12 different companies with, uh, and, and one of my companies specifically is in uh, New York. So what, what, how, how I do run project-based learning within my College of Business and Economics is that we have downloaded a a, a management tool called Yera that can track the students specifically what they are doing, where are they currently with the project, how are they interacting with the stakeholders. So each of them uh, have different sprint um, uh, meetings with the stakeholders and each and every thing that they are doing I can track and I can sit in the comfort of my home and I can look at what they are currently doing. So that's actually an excellent tool. And then what they also do is um, they will upload videos every second, every, uh, once a month at least, they upload videos of the progress and uh, what they've done with the projects. So my team is specifically IT and that's why this modality is a, a, a perfect fit for, for this uh, work integrated learning placement. So they work with a problem, an industry problem, and then they need to come up with a solution for that problem. And then at the end of the year, instead of showcasing in front of the industry members, they will have a showcase the um, development on a video. So they will make a 15 minute presentation of, of the video and then that will be sent to all industry members that will evaluate that. And then on that specific day, if it's still COVID, then they will evaluate and we will have like a team conversation with the students and the industry members where they will get feedback through teams and then the industry members can also then ask them different uh, questions. If it is not um, COVID and we can go back hopefully by the end of the year, 
then what will happen is the videos will still be sent out to the industry. They will evaluate each and every project. So all 12 industries will then evaluate the different uh, projects. And then they will come back to the university sort of uh, exhibition day of the projects. And then they will ask certain questions on that. So that's, that's how uh, we currently do it within the College of Business. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor White is also part of um, this meeting. So maybe he can also just give you feedback on, he's specifically in the marketing uh, area where his students need to do direct selling. Uh, selling. And that is currently also a little bit where we need to start thinking of different ideas and different ways of thinking. So uh, from, from the university's perspective is we have three different modalities and the one is def definitely where we need to place the students. And our biggest concern now is the placement of the students. But I do have a couple of ideas that I want to share with you of, of placement of students. And the first one is we can always think of students that can do filming of the problem. So we can tell the student, you are the lecturer, you need to use your family in your environment. Uh, and that's uh, what I suggested to Prof uh, White this morning is use the students and then ask the students to sell a project uh, uh, to sell a product to the family and by filming the the selling of the product you can then from a marketing perspective evaluate the student if they film that and send that video as a type of an assessment where the students where the lecturer then can uh, guide the student in the correct way of selling techniques or marketing techniques and stuff like that. So it's, it's real time video presentations and then also where they can connect with, with the industry. So that's just my ideas from my side. Thank you very much, Rulin. Uh, while we're on the topic there, can we maybe ask Professor White that you've mentioned to to tell us a little bit more about what he's doing, Prof. White. Is it on WhatsApp? Is here? I don't know, Marius. Okay, maybe just uh, what Marius uh, uh, students do for work integrated learning because he's not, uh, it seems to me he's not here, is they need to sell Avon products, direct selling to the market. And then if they reach a certain target, then they will, in other words, if they, they need to sell at least 5,000 uh, uh, rand of items, I think it's 5,000 rand that they need to, to sell. And if they reach their target, only then it's, it's passed or fail or they're competent or not competent in, in, in that, that specific modality of work integrated learning. And they work also with an online project called uh, DSA that was developed by the University of Johannesburg. Uh, so it's an online a platform where the students will, uh, everything will happen online. So if the students sell a product, then automatically that will be captured and they can keep track of the students, what they're selling and what they're not selling. And if they reach the target, yes or no. But the challenge for Prof. White at the moment is that the students can't um, go into and do one-on-one -on -one selling with customers because of social distancing and we're not allowed to have that interaction with people. So that's the current challenge that Prof. Wade has at the moment. Okay, 
Thank you very, very much for that uh, contribution, Rulin. Uh, Colleagues, we're going to ha have some time that we're going to try to make some notes of more or less recurring questions that came. Uh, and the one that I've noticed was from Zugisa Chabalala. So for the uploading of videos, are students going to receive data for this? Students may have challenges if they come from disadvantaged backgrounds. So Zugisa, if you could maybe just give us a bit more background then, if you have any suggestions for students who do not have access, what do we do? Um, so thank you very much for allowing me to, to speak. Um, I'm not really sure. I know the University of Pretoria, the, what we're trying to do is see if the students can use the zero rated data so that they're uploading stuff directly onto the learning management system. However, we would still, one would still need to try to see how it works because my past experience has been that if the student is uploading a video to the learning management system, it takes a very long time for the video to upload. And, and um, that creates a problem. Whereas in the past, we would have the students upload the video to a YouTube channel and just make the YouTube channel unlisted and then we can go to that video, sorry, to that link to actually assess the video. So one would need to, and I know with the University of Pretoria right now, they have limited access to YouTube via the learning management system because there was a problem with students um, misusing that facility. So one would need to really think about what to do. The other option maybe would be for the students to keep that as a portfolio of evidence. So they collect, they do the videos, but they would be marked perhaps at a different or a later stage when most or all of the students can then come on campus and use the um, data facilities or the Wi-Fi facilities at the different campuses. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ingela, I, I've seen you've had some very interesting notes that you've put on the chat. Would you maybe just elaborate a bit for us in terms of making the distinctions that you talk about? Um, Andrea, no, thank you very much. I'm just believing that we are now in an emergency situation and um, yes, developing guidelines for work integrated learning as you presented and really talked about, I think it's great. And I think that is the first, the second phase. But for the phase now, can we not talk about how do we recover the situation that we are in? Our students are not out there. They're not on the uh, workplace forum. And I would rather for this phase concentrate on what is doable for us now to get our students back onto that platform to enable them to finish their programs, specifically our final years. I'm not so much worried about the other years. The final years is very, very important that we think on guidelines and practical uh, solutions to help our students. I've just mentioned one, videos are not uh, possible at this moment. Um, we have approached the remote emergency teaching at a low tech possibility. And we're envisioning that some of our students are not going to come back even to the, um, in September or October. So those are the kind of interventions that we want to look at in terms of work integrated learning components. Recovery plans is plans, but for us to implement those, we need the professional bodies, we need the companies, I'm missing DHET in this conversation because they're responsible for CETAS and the CETAS are the work employer um, relation to the DHET. That's our link. So I would really like that we start talking about those kind of emergency guidelines that we need to put in. Thanks, Henry, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ingela. Uh, just to test uh, colleagues, Nora, uh, with everyone coming on board, uh, I know we have invited officials from DHEAD. I'm not sure if Mr. Mashabane, if he's uh, online. Whilst we're looking for that, colleague, something that you all would have noticed is that directive that came from the Minister of Higher Education and Training regarding the CETAS is that the students will still be paid. 
sort of for the time as if they seems as if they would have been working. So the stipends will not be taken from them, but that alleviates the financial problem. But like Dr. Van Staden has mentioned, how do we recover the time lost? That is a, a bit of an issue. And I uh, don't know. Other colleagues, Fundi, do you have any suggestions there that you would like to make? Um. Okay, um, my, my, I, I think when I was speaking, or I, I, I mean, I was speaking first, mine was really on the recovery plan. And for us, we think we have looked at what would, what would be the actual impact um, in terms of the time lost. And the way that we would look at that is by negotiating with the employers to keep the students just a little longer, which could be about a month or two. So we anticipate that we might have to bring the students back. Let's say that um, work starts in, 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 in earnest on the 1st of June. The student would have, would have lost, say, maybe about two months or so. And we're looking at getting the students to be able to do that in January, February. The major challenge is what you've just mentioned with the CETAs, Henry, because now, the sitters are paying the students whilst they are sitting at home. What is what 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 is what does that now mean for students who now have to be paid for an extra two months? Um, particularly when I look at my students at MUT coming from very poor backgrounds, so they're not going to be able to travel to the works of the work of place. For me, that is going to be a challenge. But um, we don't we we think that a two months extra time at the beginning of 2021 might be able to help us to recover the time that the students have lost now. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the, something that we also take into consideration is if we cannot place the students from the 1st of June, if this delay becomes, if it goes on to July or August or September, then kind of what do we need to do? And from what I've picked up from your presentation as well is to use the other will modalities uh, to make up for lost time. And then also to use, uh, I don't know, not in, I've not seen a lot of responses on using the credit allocation for work integrated learning to say if it's uh, 600 hours or oh, it can be done within four months, the, the, the 60 credits. Uh, Ruan, Clausen, you wanted to say something? I, I just want to say something. Um, how about, um, I know that in, um, when, in, clinical techno in clinical technology, um, the students have to work 1,800 hours towards the end of the year in order to complete um, their studies. How about talking to the HPCSA or governing bodies to reduce the hours to say 1,400 so that we can say that um, two months is lost is lost, and then instead of having 30 CPD points, C CPD points is um, whereby students have to submit uh, points towards the end of the year and also to complete raise that to say about 90 points in order for them to, while not working or while not doing something they can do this um, things on the platform uh, accumulate our um, accumulate points so that we can make up for the lost um, time and when looking at um, um, satisfying the, um, the people say for, like the companies that they work for in order not to um, get on their bad side um, Maybe we say that um, instead of them, when finishing their um, work integrated learning course, instead of only working for two years, how about we extend the contract to two and a half years in order to make up for the lost time that we lost? How about that for a suggestion? Okay, thank you very much for, for that contribution. Uh, Ruan, I see he's nodding. Uh, so my screen is a bit limited with whom I can see. I can see Ingela, you were nodding your head. Would you like to come in again, please? Thank you much, Henry. Yes, I do believe that is a possibility um, in some of the programs, but it is something that we can pursue with some of the companies and professional boards that we might suggest, um, but it's again going to have a financial implication. I think we need to consider that as well. Okay, thank you. Fundi? 
I, I had a um, correspondence circulated to me by um, one of our deans, um, by our dean of engineering. Apparently, the dean's forum for the engineering council is putting through a proposal to the to education, but I'm not. I, 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 I've not been informed whether this has been accepted, but they are looking at reducing the time. They are proposing that the time um, be reduced by by 100% of the time that the students have lost due to COVID-19. So it looks like the deans of engineering particularly have looked at what would be that possible impact. I, I think that it, it, is, it is a possible solution already for our engineering courses, we do allow students to be able to finish off um, two weeks before the end of their six months for every block. And what this is, what, what that, this tells us is that if um, the education department um, agrees with what the Dean's Forum um, is putting through, it's gonna be possible, I think, to apply what you're talking about in terms of the reducing the notional, notional hours, but ensuring that the students do um, complete their work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Colleagues, what I'm getting from this is it seems like uh, that the, the Dean's Associations are playing a major role in, in this regard. Uh, I think maybe the challenge for us would be is how do and Ingela, maybe you can give us a bit of guidance here. How do we link up with the various deans associations so that we can be informed sort of of the plans that they're making so that from USAF side and from this initiative side, we do not put things forward that sort of in contradiction to what the deans have been doing. Henry, is there not a possibility to work through USAF that we get the chairpersons of all the different deans associations from the different programs and uh, that use of engaged then uh, the chairs of those deans associations to ask what they've been doing have they been approached i know the ones on accounting and vcom has already submitted has already responded in terms of that so there's already a response there but that's the mechanism maybe these other ideas um, okay all right, thank you very much for that. Uh, colleagues, I'm being mindful of the time. So uh, Nora, if we can maybe just go back to the presentation that I made, sort of with those five recommendations. If you could maybe share that on the screen with us again, please. Because what I'm reading on the screen is there's a lot of issues regarding the availability of data. And I know various universities are addressing this in various ways, how to get, get students access to data and devices. But just to move our process a little bit forward, if I can ask, the, the first recommendation that we make there is there someone who is vehemently opposed to such a recommendation going out after this? To say this is something that we would, we would recommend. I know what we are busy with here is definitely not the final product, but I would just like to move this thing a little bit forward, the recommendations. And I think what it will require is to have a relook and a, a recap from this based on the on all the inputs that we've received from everyone, because uh, it seemed to me that there were lots of general trends. So can I then accept uh, recommendation one? It seems like everyone, there's no one vehemently opposed. Thank you very much. Then to uh, recommendation number two, to use the credit allocation of will to possibly reduce the time not six months, but four months in the attempt would then be, say, to, to avoid a bottleneck being created and for students spilling over to the next year. Uh, anyone vehemently opposed? Yes, I agree, we'll need engagements. Okay, agreed, agreed. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. So then if we move on to recommendation number three, use of the other will modalities. Uh, we've had a very nice presentation from you, Jay, to say what, how we can use other modalities. This is maybe something, uh, Ingela, that we can also have a look at in terms of the point that you've made of how do you catch up time? Is it possible to use some of this, these modalities? And something that we must also consider, colleagues, is to use this in conjunction with one another, not each one on its own. You know? uh, so for recommendation number three, is it something that we can go with, colleagues? I uh, see there is an agree. Okay, COVID obviously will play a role. Uh, very expensive. Okay, supported, agreed. Okay, so actually behind. Okay, agreed. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Then if we go to recommendation number four, uh, assessment, how we can use assessment, alternative assessment methods to be able to catch up time uh, and to, that we do not have, the fact that we do not have two employers all the time. Okay, video clips is a problem. Yes, due to the data. Uh, Okay, there is an agreed. Okay, agree, agree, fantastic. Reflective journals, wonderful. All right, so then we can say this is something that we can live with. And then the last one, which seems to be a bit of a more tricky one with the professional bodies. It seems um, that uh, this one, uh, if I listen now to all the presentations and comments made, that this is a bit of a more problematic one, which requires, oh, I see there's a hand raised at the day of Yusuf. You can go ahead. Okay, before, before we wait for him to or her to come online, so this is an option, if I can say it, is to request sort of conditional registration, but in itself- Hello? 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 Okay. Yes, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I, I just have a comment, not based on the slide, but to me, it, it, it seems we are making an assumption that things will go back to normal after we go to level one i don't think things will go back to normal a lot of companies a lot of organization we never come back and the reality is that if we cannot place more than 60 percent of our students before covid after covid we may not be able to place more than 40% of our students. So I think we need to start thinking in another way. Because most companies now are not actually going to train their employees by putting them in plants. They will be using augmented reality. They will be using virtual reality where students can connect to and be given a task to work in those virtual world. So I think we need to start thinking about that because that is where the future lies. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that input. Most appreciated. Colleagues, the, the last one I would say is maybe we, we need a bit of, because I understand, I, I've, looked at everyone and what everyone was saying, because this one obviously is not applicable to all programs. And then if you look at the medical field in general, there will be exceptions also, that it cannot be just applied as it is. So can I then maybe suggest that we use this one and in the right at the bottom to say, obviously, you know, professional bodies will have to be consulted and that we will first do that consult well, that would be the right, so this is something that can be considered, uh, but then obviously 
we will need permission from the relevant professional bodies to do so and that engagement will need to happen. So it cannot be applied as a blanket, when I say recommendation to every, to every program. In some cases, it is an option that, uh, that we can follow. All right, if we can close the presentation, thank you. Uh, we are almost done. Colleagues, I really want, would like to thank you uh, for your time and your participation. It really is most appreciated. Remember, this was now our first attempt to get the chats going. So uh, moving forward from this, uh, you please let us know uh, whether you would like a, a follow-up seminar to be held. Uh, maybe once we've had a bit of time to digest what we've discussed today and further feedback that might be imminent. Uh, would that be something that you would uh, agree with? To have a follow-up seminar? Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So that's one of the things that we will do. What we will also do, I think what we will need to do is to collate all your the individual emails that you've sent to me together with the input you've made on the chat today, and then maybe just refine and broaden the recommendations that we have should we feel that there is something that we need to include there. So if you guys are okay with that, I think that is the route that we can follow. Everyone comfortable with that? Okay. Then just a, a last coming from me with all the documents that I've seen to you to be completed. Uh, first was that, so you know, the template to complete with the name of the program, who's involved, how do you do it, and what are your problems and issues and the modalities that you use. That is something that is very important for us to establish our community of practice, because there we identify all the relevant role players, and especially if we want to put an, it online on LinkedIn. So I would ask you to continue to continue sending that as well as the updated one, which required less information. But the most important thing to have now, Nora, and if you can maybe bring that up, I've asked the University of Johannesburg uh, for their permission to share this. And this is what they've sent to me. If we look at the student numbers involved, because this is something that we will also have to, to point out is to say, in the question that I've asked is how many students in the program and then how many final year students are in the program. Because this will allow us just to contextualize sort of how many and the impact of how many students are impacted in this regard. So if we could use that information that the University of Johannesburg have sent to us, if you could, those of you who still have not sent your information or uh, if you, yeah, I think if we can maybe do this, uh, colleague, please let me know, Ingela, if I'm overstepping my bounds here, if we can send this through to the DBC's academic and just ask them for that information, would that be fine? You, maybe you recommend a different form or way of getting this information. Some of them have already shared this information but if you look at what's presented on the screen, if you can maybe just scroll down a little more, then you'll see this is the type of information, the list of programs and headcount numbers, and there it is, undergraduate, postgraduate, headcount, and then the number of students in their final year. This gives us more or less an indication of, you know, the number of students involved in WOL that will be able to assist us to determine the impact that this, this has. Uh, is that something that, uh, I, I know it's not, might not be possible for all universities, but I'm just thinking about a forum to get a standardized reply. Is that something that you think that could work if we send that to the DVC's academic Engelau? Uh, Sorry, may, may I add? Okay, sorry. Yes, it would be good. Thanks, uh, Henry. 
Henry, may I add something? Yes, please. What we have discovered is that uh, some programs on the ITS do not indicate on the academic structure that they have will because it is not necessarily a requirement uh, for a professional board or uh, etc. So for example, you will see that some of our health science programs that have uh, particular uh, internships, etc., are not listed here. So since compiling this document, we've now sent this to the deans because we've picked up that there is an error in the way in which it is actually recorded on the academic structure. So I would advise that we are now creating another table. We've got three tables in the document that we sent to you. And table four is a, a table which we will be sending to you later today. And that will include programs which are not listed on the ITS structure as having will, but actually do have will. Okay. So not form those programs, maybe not formally part of the curriculum, where will is not formally part of the curriculum. Well, uh, they are actually formally part of the curriculum. They just are recorded in a different way on the ITS system. And I suspect that uh, from discussions with colleagues, uh, that it's not unique to UJ. Um, so you will see here that the teacher education programs are not listed, for example. Okay. So right. the te teaching practice is not recorded on the ITS system as having a uh, will. All right. And we look forward to receiving um, that information from you. But I, I think colleagues, the point that I would try to make is that would assist us is, this is the type of statistics that we are looking for sort of in a summative abbreviated format. These are the programs with will components. This is the total number of students in the program. And then in the final year, how many students they are. It will just when determine, help us to determine sort of the severity of the impact that we're talking about. Because I think that was something that I picked up in one of the, the memos from the CHE is to be able, how do we ass assess the impact that it's uh, going to make. All right, thank you, uh, Nora. I think we can take that off the screen now. Right, colleagues, what we're gonna do in terms of sharing, I see there's uh, questions about sharing the documentation. Uh, from Yusuf's side, I know this was, um, this webinar was hosted by CUT and colleagues are not technology completely out, uh, out there. I can help myself, but I know it's hosted somewhere in the cloud. Where that cloud is, I don't know. But apparently it will be available for 48 hours and then Yusuf will do the download and then the link will be sent to all the participants of the audio of, of what we've done today. So you will be able to get this and all the presentations done. We will also email that to, to everyone who had participated. So I really would like to thank you for, for the contributions that you've made. I think we've uh, made, made nice progress in terms of getting some recommendations on the table that we can send through uh, that hopefully will provide us with a bit more guidance from CHE side. And I think regarding the final one, I will still lie haze with a couple of colleagues how to refine that one uh, regarding the professional bodies. Uh, so that it does not seem as if we're just asking for a blanket uh, section for all programs, so that, that we do realize that there are other implications that we must take into consideration. Right, colleagues. Thank you very, very much for your time. I appreciate it and for all your inputs and chats. So nice to see. And again, what was very heartwarming, just when people came online, I mean, the fact that we can again see one another, see the faces, what they've looked like and that we didn't change too much over this period. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And we will 
continue you know, to ask for your assistance as we're moving forward. So thank you very much and good luck for, for the rest of the time and please stay safe. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye bye all. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs>Of the colleagues that's still online, is there maybe someone that has a pressing issue that you would like to discuss, to ask? Okay, so then maybe if we can stay a little bit longer online, sort of uh, Laura, you and Zana, and the Lindas, uh, so that we can just finalize our arrangements moving forward from here. Henry, uh, I'm going to stop now. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you.